Hey everyone, we got a few more minutes, so we're just going to kind of hang out. Looks like we got a few people already in the room. <clears throat> going to continue getting set up. So, how was everyone's week this week? That'll work. Yep, just grabbing some stuff for tonight's tying. Actually, that was the hook I wanted. Um. So, I mean, I'll go over this again, but we're going to cover tonight um, a couple of weed guards. So just kind of, you know, your basic weed guards. I don't use them a lot. I'm going to be the first one to say, but I've got a couple that I use that I do like, um, including one that I would love to be able to give uh, credit to whoever or wherever I saw it. I don't remember. When I get to it, I'll tell you. Um, okay, Rick, you ate a lot of chips. Okay. Um <laughs> So, yeah, we're coming up on time. So, pull out a hook. And for this first part, truly, guys, it doesn't matter what hook you're tying on. These hooks are going to end up getting, when I'm done, going to take a uh, razor blade to them, clean them up, and uh, put them back into the packaging. There's just kind of some demos on weed guards. I'm not going to do them on a fly. When we actually go to tie our fly tonight, that will have the uh, weed guard on it and it'll have one and I'll explain why I use that one for that fly. So just the vice. So, all right guys, well, it's 6.30. Wanna say welcome to everybody, anybody who uh, wasn't around when I was on. And uh, yeah, looks like we're gonna have a good time tonight. We're gonna cover up some stuff like I already talked about. I'm going to do some weed guards. So, well, I guess we'll get started with that. So, first thing we're going to cover is kind of the weed guard I use the least. Um, and I guess I should probably start out by talking about weed guard material. So, what I use for my weed guard material is truly just plain old monofilament. Um, hard mono if I can get it. I don't have any right now. Um, and I am literally using, and it is some good old Orvis super strong. I got some 35 pound because uh, I don't have any of my lighter line weights. I don't know where they went. I think actually I knew we used up some of them for uh, liters for healing waters, but I'm using this stuff. And when I say it's old, first off, Orvis hasn't used a, a best buy date in a long time. This one says you best used by January of 2008. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's old, it's junk, at least for using as an actual leader but it's going to work great for what I'm trying to do here. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to cut off a piece. I do like to put a little burn into the ends, um, at least into one end. Grab a good old Bic lighter. You know, we all got them sitting around the house. Now, if you look, I don't know if you can really see it all that well. This thing's got a massive amount of, of uh, memory to it. You know, 2008, and it's been sitting on a spool. 12 years that it's been out of date, sitting on a spool, and it means that it was probably three or four years before that. Yeah, we're talking ancient line. So, first one I'm going to cover is kind of similar to what Brian had used um, when he was tying up his, uh, the deer hair fly, um, when we kind of uh, poked and prodded Brian a bit into uh, putting on a weed guard, which, by the way, thanks, Brian, for being a good sport on that one. Um, so what we're going to do is literally, this is about the challenge of this one. I've got a little, and you probably can't see it super well, little ball burned into the end. I'm up by the eye. Guys, imagine there's a fly here. Um, you know, we're going to do this, uh, these weed guards as basically you're, you know, as you're imagining there's a fly. So I'm going to put it on your side. Normally I put it on my side. I'm going to put it on your side. And I'm basically just going to do a couple of wraps around it. Kind of get it locked in. Pull it down a little bit. Get it locked in a little bit better. Okay. So now, take it. You got to bend it. This is one of the problems with 35. 35 doesn't like to work with you. Um... Why we always talk about, you know, using a little bit lighter line weights. And if it was up to me, I'd be using like 25 on this, but I don't have any around the house. 
And uh, yeah. So if you look, literally the only thing I did was I took it, wrapped it in. So it was kind of going this way and then bent it and wrapped it on the other side to kind of force it going this way. And what it's going to do is it lines up with that hook. Now I'm going to shorten it up because it's what you should do. This is going to be your least intrusive weed guard. So in other words, it's going to be the weed guard that does the least amount of weed guarding for you. Um, now, granted, I'm using a B10S here. Maybe not the hook I'd use this design of a weed guard on. Um, this is something I'd use more on a shorter shank hook. Uh, do it for something like, um, you know, maybe a bonefish fly, let's say. Um, and I forgot one tool. Uh, forgot to pull it out. So, my whip finisher. I'm just going to whip finish this one off. Like I said, guys, these right here, I'm not expecting anyone to sit here and tie these up with me. Um, right now is more just demoing and showing you guys some options on how to put in weed guards. Especially, you know, you start fishing some of these summertime ponds, you know, you want to fish around, you know, wood, woody structure, definitely. Um, we can't always take a fly and tie it so it's riding hook point up. And hook point up isn't always how we want it to ride anyways around wood. I found that if you're fishing a subsurface fly with a hook point up, I've been able to get it to hang the tree just about as many times as if it was hook point down. Um, but, you know, just something to help keep that weed, help keep it from going in. So that's the first one. And that's the one I literally use the least. Guys, I use that one. I probably haven't done one of those in years because only thing I really would ever use it for is bonefish flies. I don't tie a lot of bonefish flies. Um, Unfortunately, you know, until someone can get me a couple of bonefish trips in a row, I don't tie a lot of them. So next one I'm going to tie is actually the one I'm going to demonstrate for you, um, actually on a fly. But I'm going to tie it without the fly first so that you're not starting it and then all of a sudden at the end finishing it. So start out putting thread down on hook because, you know, that's a requirement for tying flies. Um, actually, it isn't. I did see a fly not too long ago where they literally just used glue on the hook. I thought that was actually kind of funny. Um, kind of got rid of the whole thread thing. So pull out the mono. I didn't leave myself enough room the last time, so I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut a good long section on this. I'm going to cut a good six inches. This is That's way more than what I need. Take that. Burn this end. Yeah, um, good point, Brian. Um, especially if you're playing around with some of those Indo-Pacific bonefish. Um, you know, the bonefish, when typically we're talking about them, we're talking about the Atlantic bones. Um, they're kind of a little weird creature. Um, I know there are also bonefish in San Diego, which I've never had the opportunity to catch, but a buddy of mine targets them fairly regularly. Um, so, tying it in. Guys, that, you know, tying it in. Now, if you're doing this on the fly, I'll show you, but it's literally the first thing that you do. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to try to keep this monofilament on top of the hook. This is kind of where you do a little bit of a, you know, dance with it. You fight with it and you play with it and, and you're going to wrap partially down the hook. Um, I'm going about a third of the way down the hook. So wrap back up. Okay, now... Imagine, you know, hackles coming off the back and, you know, foam everywhere. Yeah, kind of that sort of thing. Now, one thing I'm going to do, something that I can do with a Rensetti vise. Um, if you've got a got one of the old school Thompson AAs, I don't remember if this trick works. Uh, Regals, I know generally it doesn't work. You basically just put the monofilament through the gap in the uh, vise. Makes life so much easier. So now I'm going to sit here, you know, we're tying on hackles, we're tying on flash, we're tying on, you know, all the fun stuff. It's time to finish the fly. Haven't put a head on the fly yet. And remember how we talk about, you know, the head is that very last part. Haven't put that on yet. Now what we're going to do, we're going to start, and if you can look, and you can see my, uh, the monofilament here. 
it's actually really long right now. There's a purpose for that. Now we gotta get it wrapped in, two or three wraps, light wraps. These were not hard wraps. These were not locked down, you know. I'm using flat wax nylon because um, I've been in love with it for years and I finally get to go back to using it. And I love flat waxed. Um, two tendon ear, this is stuff, you know, yeah, it's not gel spun, gel spun thread I could uh, pretty much pull a car with. This, I can pull a, a compact car with it. Um, I definitely could pull a Japanese key car with it. Yeah, it's uh, it's still plenty strong. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull on it. And if you look, I'm kind of getting it lined, you know, I'm basically pulling it up. So I'm underneath of that hook still. And I want to leave a little bit of a gap so that if it bumps, it's got a little bit of room. Now, if I'm stripping hard and I go to strip, basically do almost a strip set, I'm going to pull that right into whatever I'm trying to keep out of. So that's one thing you got to think about when you're working with these. You don't always, you know, you're not always going to be sitting there ripping the fly. Um, I, you know, it's one of those uh, things. A lot of us aren't generally ripping flies, but there are times that that's what they want. So if you looked, I had actually gone and pulled it tight. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it off with a little bit of extra. Don't know where I put my lighter. Hey, that's where I put my lighter. Be very, very careful. Literally, if you saw what I did, and I don't know if you guys can actually see it, um, I know that my video that I've got playing for me is actually a whole lot lower quality from what I understand um, than what I normal than what you guys are seeing. I put a tiniest of little balls on there. Now all I'm gonna do is take it, I'm gonna wrap it down. I want to basically just wrap it in. You know, and try to get that little guy covered up. I didn't do a good job. I left it a little bit longer than I'd like. But hey, whatever. You know what? Let's go into my fly box anyways. So that is technique number two. I got a third one. Um, and those are the two most common weed guards you will see. Besides the veed one, which is basically the first one with two pieces of monofilament. And I don't ever use the bead one. Um, never liked it. Never learned how to tie it. I don't know why I'm being so cautious right here. Um, I'm acting like it's an actual fly. I'm not acting like uh, it's going to get the uh, it's going to get a piece of uh, or a razor blade to it in about half an hour. Rick, it really if you're fishing hyper spooky fish, it can. Um, I've never really run into that situation because typically when you're putting a weed guard into a situation, those fish are pretty, they're pretty keyed in and they're in a rough environment. So they're not looking as closely. Um, or would we put a weed guard onto an Adams, you know, or onto, you know, onto a Trico, during a Trico hatch? No, they're going to reject it then. But we would never do that. Um, you know, typically the flies that I'm putting weed guards on are super impressionistic. Um, I mean, the fly we're doing tonight, I don't know if you could get more, much more impressionistic. Um, it literally doesn't look like anything. Um, it's there for a purpose. It's there to make noise. Um, so typically, yeah, I don't find it to be a problem. Um, yeah, you could use fluorocarbon. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have any. Well, I do, but I don't have any in heavy weights. Um, all my fluorocarbon is in light line weights uh, from 3X, 4X, and 5X. I don't even have 6X fluoro. So, now, this one's going to start off just like the last one. This is the one that I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, I don't remember where I saw this. I know I saw it in a magazine. Um, that tells me it was probably in fly tire. Um, because it's the kind of thing that would be in a fly tire magazine. I just don't remember when, where, you know, three years ago, four years ago. One thing I remember seeing is going like, oh, that's cool. So cutting in, nice long piece. If you ever wonder how long a big lighter lasts for a fly tire, it should be near nearly forever, because that's about how much we ever use them. 
unless you're lighting cigars or something while you're tying. That's a whole other thing. So first part of this, just like the last one. And now this is one I would not use on something with only a little bit of flotation. This next one is one that I would use something with a lot of foam or a lot of deer hair or subsurface. And you'll see why in a second. So imagine deer hair, deer hair, deer hair, hackle, deer hair, hair, deer hair, some sort of a crazy brush. I don't know, you know. Imagine stuff going on. Next thing I'm going to put on, metallic beads. Um, I got these from Joanne Fabrics years ago. Um, these are, uh, basically, I got them as an experiment. And because the fact that I didn't have a whole lot of uh, good size beads, um, these are just brass metallic beads. I would never suggest using a bead like this for actual tying. Um, we're using like for a bead head, they don't have the right size holes. Um, just, it, it doesn't work. Um, I've tried it. I've tried plastic ones. Um, I've used plastic ones in the past. You got about a one in four chance that it's even going to go on the hook. Otherwise, generally they just shatter in half when you try to go around the bend of the hook. So this is the one place I will say, go to Joanne's and get a bead. You can guess if I've got beads, what I'm going to do with them. And I'm going to th just throw two on, just for example. You know, you could do three, you could do four. Um, you know, you could sit there and do a fly with a fairly large amount of weight um, to it. And if you notice what I'm doing, yeah, that you're seeing it right. Going to wrap it in, do my couple of wraps, pull tight. So, you look, I got, a, I got beads that are just below. This is one of those times I want something a little bit stronger, or a little bit less strong so I can be able to get them to line up better for me. So, you got these couple of weights down here. You know, we talk about dumbbell eyes being, you know, on the top of the fly, and that weights the fly to flip it over. Oh, right, you got weight down here now. Guess what you got? Yeah, that's right. You got a keel. Um, it's similar to a belly scratcher. Um, belly scratcher actually has it going over this way, Brian. Um, or at least the way I was taught the belly scratcher, it has it going over this way. This has it going underneath. It uses it as a weed guard. Um, so I've tied up the belly scratcher. Uh, did actually really well on Mossy with it um, when I was fishing it. Um, because also when you think about it, these beads are going to rattle a little bit. So great for bass flies. Um, yeah, and I, it's probably one of those things where this technique probably came from the belly scratcher. It was, I doubt, well, I don't know. I can't say I doubt, but I, you know, sometimes you wonder when did, when did somebody come up with this idea? Um, and it could, you know, who knows which one was first, but somebody looked at this and looked at the belly scratcher and said, oh yeah, we'll just do that. So again, just going to wrap it in. Yep, uh, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The atoms. The atoms came first. Uh, that's the that's how you answer that question every time. Um, actually, if you really want to be right, um, the Kabari came first. Uh, welcome to Tenkara, 500-year-old pattern. So uh, you can say that. Um, so a little bit of Tenkara knowledge. But that's just a simple one. But think about it this way. That's weight there. So you want to have something with some with some floating ability. Um, definitely need that ability to float to be able to create this part of the pattern. Um, just thought of something. Oh, never mind. I was thinking I was missing a material. Um, so I don't know why I'm finishing it off so pretty. I could just do a hand whip. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely want to use metallic beads for this. Uh, that actually was one of the challenges that I had was um, 
the the girl at Joanne probably thought I was a little crazy when I asked, "Do you guys have any metallic beads?" And then um, she was showing me really big ones. I'm like, "No, no, no! I want small metallic beads." And of course, she kept handing me plastic ones. I'm like, "No, I don't want it to look metallic. I want it to be made out of metal." Yeah, um, you know, it's one of those times in Joanne Fabrics where you, uh, as a fly tire, walk out of there and go, "Hmm, that person probably thinks I'm a little weird." You know what, though? I don't care. Um, really doesn't bother me that uh, I'm not in that store. All that don't remember me. So, went over the weed guards. Like I said, the middle one is the one that I use predominantly. Um, the last one's one that I do use from time to time. Um, I'll probably use it a bit. I've got a trip coming up uh, where I'm definitely going to need some stuff and going to need that little bit of rattle. It's going to be nice, and I'm going to need a weed guard. And, uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about it. So I've also got some stuff coming up this summer, hopefully, that I'm definitely going to need some good weed guards. So talking to a good buddy of mine. So now let's get into the thing that we actually posted a picture of. Um, the weed guard was because, you know, I've had we've had the request for a weed guard. Threads wrapped around the bobbin, giving me way too much tension. Put down our hook. So, um, yeah, Brian, you do know where I'm going, but do you know about the other trips? Um, I'll, I'll give you a hint. You don't. Uh, they, they literally came in the last couple of days. So, hook that I'm using, Gamagatsu B10S. I'm using a size one. You can do this in a size four. You can use a standard saltwater hook. Guys, I'm I'm not a hook snob. I'm not somebody who says you must use this hook unless there's some particular reason on the pattern. Like uh, when you tie the CK bait fish, why do we tie it on the B10S or there's a mustad kind of version of it? Um, and we tie it in a specific size. It's because of the fact that William one when he cuts them when he cuts the tails they are cut to a size they're cut based around this hook you know this and the mustad hook and that actually helps give you that action for this fly it's a schmino um you know Steve can tell us the whole story on the schmino I don't remember all of it um you know Western Florida Anna Maria Island area um awesome on schnook um but also is really effective on largemouth. Yep. Yeah, definitely, Bob. That would be an awesome idea. Um, like I said, I don't use this style as much as I should. And um, once I can start going into the craft stores uh, more effectively, and uh, I don't have to wait in line because I can tell you my Joann's around me, usually has an hour plus wait to be able to get in. And uh, I'm not going to wait an hour to get some beads. No offense. Um, I'll use what I got. I've got quite a few of them. Um, you know, a little jar. Yeah, craft stores are fun. Um, just remember, most of them have uh, have coupons you can find online. Everyone keeps telling me that. I never bring them in that I get yelled at. So just going to wrap in. I'm using brown thread for this one, and you'll see why. Um. Use a thread color, whatever thread color you want. I'm not here to tell you what to do. So, cut off another section. Eh, I probably got about another 10 feet of line left on there. Um, I literally bought a spool and never used it. Yes, they can. <laughs> um, Joanne Fabrics also. Um, so for me, the, my two closest craft stores are Michael's and Joanne Fabrics, um, depending on which direction I want to drive. Um, Hobby Lobby is about twice the distance, so I don't go there very often. So I'm going to start out doing the same thing we had done last time on that fly, on the weed guard. Tied it in, tied it in the back. Came down, we're coming down around the back side of the hook. We're trying to keep it, you know, centered up on that hook. Then we're gonna take it 
and I'm going to put it down through. That's going to get in my way. I know it is. I'm going to deal with it. Um, I'm stubborn like that. You don't have to be. So I'm going to tie a schmino. Yeah, it says schmino, but I'm going to tie one kind of shrimpy. Um, I'm looking for uh, something that's going to look like a fleeing shrimp coming out of the grass. Uh, that should help tell some people where I'm going to be. Um, so, and no, it will not be the place that I usually go for that sort of thing, unfortunately. Um, so I'm just basically taking, I'm taking hook shank length. Okay, yeah, I know if you look at this, I'm just a little bit longer. That's fine. That won't bother me one bit. Wrap back up to the bend of the hook. Tie in. Again, I can get a phone call. I did two wraps. I can get a phone call. I can walk away. I can walk away for five days if I want to. Um, I don't know why I ever would, but, you know, I do get phone calls regularly and have to put down my tying. Um, so I'm going to wrap back up, and I'm going to stop kind of a little bit past the halfway mark. And, again, that's one of those you'll see why in a minute. Cut off your extra. Wrap it in. Wrap back to the beginning. Holy cow, Jeff's going to use flash. Uh, for this one, I'm going to use some copper crystal flash. I'm not here not to here to tell you what kind of flash to use because honestly, flash, each one will give you a different effect, um, kind of what you're looking for. Crystal flash is just sort of flashy. Um, it's not like a you know flash that's going to give you definitive lateral lines or anything like that. Um, this stuff's in horrible shape because it's been sitting in my fly box for my fly tying box for a while. Um, and my organization is horrible compared to Brian's. I'll just be the first one to admit that. Uh, one of these days, I always say one of these days, I'm actually going to sit down, pull all my fly tying materials out and organize them. And it's sort of like if you've got a three car garage and you can't even open up the door kind of uh, situation where you're like, I could do that. Man, that's not going to be fun. Yeah, that's kind of the situation I'm in with uh, my fly tying materials. So maybe not three car garage worth. I, I'd love to be able to say I've got that much, but unfortunately I do have a fair amount um, of random stuff. Just trimming up the other end to get it all equal. So we're going to tie this in and I'm going to tie it in on your side, opposite side to me. When you're tying it in yourself, always tie it in on your side. I'm just going to tie it in so you guys can see. Again, I can walk away. You know, only reason I'm tying it in the far side is so you guys can see what I'm doing. And, of course, it's going off the camera, but I'm trying to even out the tips. So now, now that I've done that, I'm going to take the other piece. Um, it works, and in reality, that's really where the first flash material ever really came from. Um, I'm not a big fan of it, Jonathan. It's a little bit Christmas tree tinsel. Sorry if anybody can't see the uh, question. Um, yeah, some tinsel has wire. The other thing is that it's really, really, really flexible. Um, a little bit actually too. It's a little bit too limp in my opinion. Um, it's going to foul really bad. So what I'm doing here is I'm holding it on both sides and I'm wrapping back. Okay, and now I got way too long of a tail. And to still cut it a little bit long, because I can, and that's what I want to do. Um, but we got a lot of flash in there. Yeah, guys, uh, remember how I always talk about how I don't like using a lot of flash? Well, things happen. Um, just feel like a lot of flash tonight. So, next thing I'm going to grab, good old Estaz. Um, you can use standard chenille. Um, I got some Estaz here. It happens to actually match sort of everything. Um, it's kind of a shrimpy looking color. So, and it's what I'm trying to tie, but if you're trying to tie this up and you want to tie it in all white or chartreuse or red or whatever color you want, I, I'm not here to tell you. Brian, yeah, I would, uh, I'd invest in Krennic. Um, I've got a lot of flashes. 
Um, I've got a lot of different kinds that I've used over the years. Um, definitely uh, one of those things that if I see some new style of flash I've never seen before, I usually pick it up uh, in a fly shop and play with it. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've got so many random materials is if I see something I've never seen before, I'll just buy it and play with it, um, see what it can do, see if it fits into anything that I do. Um, so uh, there's a reason why I don't go into fly shops that often anymore, because if I do, I usually end up spending a lot more money than what I planned on. Um, got a specific fly shop where they actually try to push me to spend more. Um, they, they know me in there. So just tying this in. And now I'm going to wrap back to basically where my material had stopped. Yeah. Any questions, guys? Uh, I mean, reach out. In the email that Brian sends out, my name's in there. Um, it's I'm Jeff Greendike. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to me if you want. Um, actually, you can just message on the Facebook uh, page. Just put a message in. Um, Brian or I will see it. Um, I don't know who generally sees them first. It's really a 50 50 shot, but if it goes to, if it still has to go to somebody, we we'll usually will hand it off to the other. Um, so now I'm just going to wrap it. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to cover up everything. Um, so if you've ever have tied a crystal bugger, right now, kind of looks like a crystal bugger. Um, <laughs> hey, what do you know? We're taking a fly that we already know and we're going to modify it. So, one thing I probably didn't mention was the traditional Schmino has dumbbell eyes. This fly doesn't have dumbbell eyes. I want it to float. Um, I've never been successful at making a fly with dumbbell eyes float. So, um, sure, now a challenge has been handed to me by somebody. But what I'm just going to do is I wrapped, I back wrapped, which I usually hate whenever I do because I always forget that. It makes it real fun to then try to tie off at the end. And I'm leaving some distance here. Um, as my vice is moving around on top of my laptop. Oh, that's always a good thing. So hopefully in a few weeks, guys, we're going to have some uh, new technology coming up and uh, won't be using, at least I won't be using my laptop for doing these. So right now, again, we can walk away. Yeah, you know, Brian, that, that's you. I've never cast a clouser into a tree. That's reserved for uh, usually CK bugs, you know, the really expensive cork ones, or, uh, you know, other top water patterns that I'm trying to cast underneath the tree who somehow end up 30 feet up. Um, I have a unique ability of putting a fly that I was trying to put right on the water surface 30 feet into a tree. Um, and ask one of my buddies. Uh, he's a, a friend of friend of our of us, um, Matt Riley. He will tell you about. Uh, he and I were fishing last summer, and I literally put one thirty feet up in the tree. And he looked at me and said, "Well, I'm not going to get that. Are you?" Um, he was guiding me uh, on the New River, and I basically laughed. And I looked at him. And I said, "Nope." But unfortunately, I wished I hadn't used zero X because I tried to break it, and zero X is hard to break. So now I'm going to grab my good old craft foam. Um, Came from Ben Franklin Crafts. Wow, that's an old name. Um, so, and it cost a whole 33 cents. Guys, it normally isn't this cheap anymore. This thing is ancient. I don't know how long I've had this piece. Um, but that also tells you, uh, literally the size of a sheet of paper, really cheap. You know, when you think you get a piece that's like about this by this, I can't even get both fingers in um, like that big for like two, three dollars at a fly shop. Yeah, this is definitely the way to go. Um, one of those other craft store things to buy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out a piece, um, pretty long piece, and I'm going to go maybe three eighths of an inch wide. Um, cut it as straight as we can, and I did not cut it straight, but hey. Um, I failed that in kindergarten, um, failed cutting. So, but now I've got this piece here. Now what I'm going to try to do is cut into more or less squares. 
And what I want them to be is about the same length. This is where you start stacking them and cutting them. And I'm going to sit here for a minute, let everyone get caught up. Because I forgot one other tool. Um, I don't know where my bodkin went off to. But I'm going to cut more pieces than I know that I need uh, for this. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Um, I haven't been on the Outer Banks in a couple years. Um, I just heard they're opening up a fly shop down there. Uh, just got word on that today. That's actually really cool. Um, always said I wanted to open up a fly shop on the Outer Banks. So now I've just basically cut out little squares. You can do this beforehand. Um, if you've got one of those like sheet cutters, like, you know, paper cutters that comes down like this, you know, it's not a, not always a bad idea to use it and cut one of these things up and, you know, cut a couple of colors up and put them into little boxes. Um, not ever a bad idea. Oh, that'll work if I have to use it. <laughs> so, Steve, this one actually, uh, you're the one who got me into tying these things. I'm just doing a variation on it. So, um, hey Steve, who was the guy who invented this? Uh, I don't remember. So, open everybody's caught up, got the squares. Right now, only I'm doing is I'm taking, um, use a bodkin for this. Do not use your expensive uh, scissors. Uh, expensive razor scissors, but I'm poking a hole through because, you know, and I'm trying to get it as centered as I can, but if I don't get it perfect, it's fine. So did forget one thing. Sorry, guys, I did forget one thing, and I always do that whenever I'm tying this. You get a little whip finish practice when you're doing this. Yep, Ziegler, Norm, that's who it was. Um, cool guy. I remember meeting him uh, years ago. Uh, at my old job. Really nice guy. Um, so I just cut my thread. There's no thread on this fly at the moment. You will definitely a good thing to have is uh, head cement or not head cement. Um, super glue. Whether you use the gel, the brushable, non brushable for this, there isn't really a preferred one. Um, and in fact, actually, the, the gel is probably my least preferred. Yep. And he, Norm Ziegler literally is known for this, for the Schmino. Um, Norm Ziegler, if you ever walk into a shop, if you ever ask him what are they biting on, he'll say the Schmino. Every time. Literally, they could be feeding on mullet that are a foot long, and he'll tell you throw the Schmino. That's what he's known for. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of head cement on. Sort of laughed a few years ago. Uh, I had a friend who went down to Sanibel for a vacation. And he calls me up while he's down there and goes, man, you wouldn't believe. Walked into a fly shop and this guy was telling me, you know, you had told me to throw clousers. And this guy goes and says, no, don't throw clousers. And I go, he said throw the schmino, didn't he? He goes, how'd you know? I go, you met Norm. Um, <laughs> and I mean, he went down there and he caught his first schnook that way, um, which is really cool. So. What I just did there is I put on the first one. I put a little bit of super glue on the uh, hook shank to help hold it there. Um, now this is going to be a repeating step. Poke hole through. Take a little bit of super glue. And this is one of those things you don't need much. Um, we really want to use almost essence of super glue here. So it's about the only perk to the uh, gel is that you do have a little bit of working time right here. But at the same time, I don't like it because you've got working time. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take both hands. I'm going to compress these two together. This should start kind of giving you an idea of where we're going. Um,
So I'm on piece number three. My goal is to get four pieces. Um, that's always my goal. But since I'm doing a weed guard, I want to leave a little bit of room in the front. Um, when I was actually tying this for the picture, um, for you know, for you guys to have and uh, for Brian to send out and to use as the thumbnail for this video, the first one I kind of tied and forgot to put the weed guard on. Um, yep, I know. Uh, mistakes were made. Had to go tie it again. Luckily, as we've seen, this is a pretty quick fly to tie. Um, this is another one of those quick box fillers. You know, hey, I need I need some stuff to go out tomorrow. You know, or hey, uh, all of a sudden I've got an opportunity to get out on the water uh, after dinner, and it's five o'clock. Let me quick tie up a couple of things and go hit the water real quick after dinner. That sort of a situation, um, which is always a fun one. So. Again, just a little bit. A little bit goes a long way with super glue. Because um, remember, we're not trying to really hold to a massive hold. We're just kind of trying to make sure that everything stays tight. So push it all together. Compress down. Get super glue on your fingers. Um, luckily, they didn't glue together. Yes, I have glued my fingers together more than once. So now what I'm going to do is this is blocky. Yeah, I know it's called a blockhead. I don't really like the total blockiness of it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm literally just going to take my scissors and trim up the corners. So I'm not rounding it totally. I'm just kind of taking a bit of the edge off. Kind of round, you know, kind of Rounding over those edges just a bit. Um, got super glue on my scissors. That's always a good thing. It's a great way to destroy a good pair of scissors. So now we got to put that uh, front piece of the weed guard back on. We're going to tie in. You notice a lot of my flies are just taking stuff off, putting it back on. That is one of the traits that I have um, with my tying. Um, if you really don't like having to do that, you know, this is one of those flies you don't have an option. There are a lot of times you don't have to do what I do, but this is one of those flies you need that thread out of the way. So now what we're just going to do is do our best to try to catch that. I did not leave myself a whole lot of room up here. See, I, I did a horrible job. Um, <laughs> so this is going to be fun. Back off a couple wraps. And it's going to fight me massively. Of course. Hey guys, you're not the only one who things fight with when you're tie trying to tie. There we go. That was a lot of fighting. Um, so now I'm just going to pull this up from kind of where I want it. That one's kind of looking to where I want it right now. Now, one thing is, is that because it's got this block, it's going to force this down a little bit. You're going to get a little different shape than you did whenever I can get to it. If you've got nothing on there, um, you're going to get a little bit different shape. This is kind of just goes straight down to the hook, whereas this one kind of comes down and comes across. Uh, it's just kind of a fact of life. Now we're gonna take our scissors, trim this end, save that, because that actually is still not enough. I am using up a lot of monofilament tonight. Oh. Um, wrap in, make sure we're not covering up the eye of the hook. Do not cover up the eye of the hook. We've all done it. I've done it. Brian's done it. I remember Brian doing it. I've never seen Steve do it. I've never seen Rick do it. Actually, I don't remember, honestly. But no, we've all covered up the eye of the hook at some point. So 
Yeah, Brian, I I, I seem to remember a uh, woolly bugger early on. So, in fact, I think that might still be in my locker at Orvis. I think that bugger might still be in there. So, that is a blockhead schminnow. So, the cool thing with this fly is that, one, super basic, box filler. You know, guys, remember, these are, you know, a lot of what I do is box fillers. They are there to be quick, dirty, you know, effective. And is a key to all these flies is to be effective. <coughs> Haven't coughed all day, by the way. Um, but, you know, they're there. They're quick. They allow you to fill up your box. So this one's cool. You got the Shimano. You got a lot of flash in it. And it's going to kind of sit tail down in the water. Um, you know, it's one thing about it is you've got the marabou that's going to soak up some water. It's going to cause it to sit down. Um, and that's the other thing. With this blockhead, it pushes a lot of water and it sprays it out. And it looks, and it'll kind of jump a little bit. So it looks like a fleeing, you know, I'm tying this up to look like kind of like a little fleeing shrimp. Um, but you can tie it up to look like a little fleeing bait fish. Um, I don't know if I would tie it up to look like a fleeing crayfish because I've never seen a crayfish jump out of the water to flee. But I'm sure they do. Um, you know, but something like that, you know, have it look like something. And it's a reactionary bite. Uh, reality, most of what I tie is going for reactionary bites. The fishing style I like. Um I really do enjoy that, you know, cast it, strip it, you know, get them to just turn and whack at it. Um, don't even give them time to think about what they're eating. Um, kind of the way I like to eat too, is, you know, just not even think about it, just eat it. So um, now we can tie another one of these if you'd like, or if anybody, uh, you know, I don't even know what time it is, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we've been going for a little bit over an hour. Uh, if anybody would like to, we can tie up another one. Just put it in the chat. That down in my box. Well, I'm not seeing any nose, so I'm going to do another one. Um, do the same colors. Well, do similar colors. Do it even shrimpier, but I'm going to do this one without the weed guard. Um, I don't tie with the weed guards like I said in the beginning. I don't tie with weed guards a ton. Um, I got a little bit of a need for some, so I'm going to tie up a few, but I don't have a massive need for them um, with where I'm going. Uh, a lot more open water. So, yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, I can imagine if you tie this up in white or chartreuse, um, even brown, but yeah. Definitely. I mean, uh, Brian and I've got a list of things we'd like to do, but or I know I do. But you know, anybody who wants to uh, give us some, give us some ideas of what you want to see, we're more than happy to. Wow, that is the junkiest marabou feather I have ever seen come out of strung marabou. I should send a picture of that to uh, Mossy Creek because that's where I got this uh, package from. I'm kidding. You always you always end up with one or two bad ones in every pack. So just grabbing some marabou. Super poofy. You know what? Guys, give me one moment. I need to grab. I thought I had a uh, dumbbell eyes right here, and I apparently. Yes, I do. <laughs> they're large dumbbells. Um, or no, they're mediums. They're lead. Um, so I'm going to tie this one, not as a blockhead. I'm going to do a traditional schmino with this one, um, unless everyone wants to see a blockhead again. So at this point, I can go either way. Oh, absolutely, Steve. We can do that. Um, that 
things of that nature will be coming. Um, Brian, not funny, dude. Not funny. If you if you want traditional, Brian, you can do traditional. Um, so uh, Brian knows that I don't like tying traditional dry flies because I uh, never learned how to. Um, my uh, my teacher didn't teach me, but I am more than happy to do to do uh, to do good old uh, um, love tying parachutes. The other ones that I love, I can tie up some show off some of my brook trout flies that I do like to tie. Um, got some, gonna need some new equipment to be able to do that, guys. And uh, honestly, it's on its way. So, you know, as we get a little bit further on into summer, we're probably gonna have to go over to it. Just cutting down my uh, flash. I'm using a whole lot less flash this time. Oh, Brian, you said traditional. Did you mean uh, traditional schmino or traditional uh, dry flies? Yeah. Okay, you want traditional schmino. Okay, cool. I'm going to do a traditional schmino then. Luckily, we were still at a spot where I could do it. So what we're going to do is tie it similar to a clouser. We're going to come back a couple eye hook eyes. Um, I'm actually a little bit far. Um, I'm going to go to somewhere around that third mark forward. Um, so remember with the B10S, the barb usually lines up with the start of the bend of the hook, somewhere in that general area, about a third forward. Tying in our eyes, trying not to cover everything up for you guys. So doing a bunch of figure eights over top. And then here's what I do. A lot of people put in a drop of super glue so it'll never move. I wrap around the bottom. Um, learn that trick from Captain Tommy. Doesn't move now. Um, so if anybody follows uh, Mossy Creek and sees the flies that they have coming into their shop, those are all tied by Captain Tommy Mattioli, um, all those clousers and whatnot. Uh, Tommy's a good buddy of mine. Um, you know, we spent a lot of years together fishing and so, yep. Now we're just gonna take, we're gonna go all the way up to the front with our thread. We're gonna wrap forward. Now I'm using a lighter color Estaz this time. Um, why? Cause I got it. Um, and one thing, if you notice that I'm doing is I'm actually leaving, cause this is a much lighter one. I'm actually leaving a little bit of space in between each. I don't know, yep, you can see it on the video. I'm leaving a little bit of space. It's kind of creating, you know, when we talk about tying nymphs or whatever, getting that segmentation. I'm putting in segmentation in here. So now we're behind the eye of the hook. We're gonna do two wraps, go forward a wrap, and now we're gonna go up and over. Up, whoop, up and over. And this is the reason why when you got a whole pile of extra, it makes it real fun. Um, and then we do a wrap in the front and we tie off in the front. And uh, hey guys, that's about the whole fly. Um, this is one of those super quick, this is tied pretty heavy uh, for a Shimano. Typically, um, as I remember, and the way typically this is tied, it's actually tied with bead chain eyes uh, because you're trying to keep it kind of higher up in the water column. Um, I tied this one with dumbbells because one, I had them with me. Two, my bead chain eyes are upstairs. Um, three, my wire cutters are nowhere to be found at the moment. Um, so I can't cut bead chain. I don't know where I put my wire cutters. Uh, they're not in my fly tying kit. They're not in my tool kit. They're somewhere. Um, I got a feeling that somebody stole them. Um, I blame that person to be father. Uh, they were a really nice set. So 
you know, at some point in your life, you start, you know, you realize who's stealing all your tools. But now we just kind of create our head. Find our uh, whip finish tool. If you've got to do this as a uh, as half hitches, that's just fine. Um, if you can't whip finish, that's fine. Half hitches work great. Um, you know, I learned how to use the whip finish tool. Um, I seem to remember, actually, I might have taught you guys at some point by accident how to tie a, a hand whip um, years and years and years ago. It's one of those things that came back in my memory one time. But that fly's done. Um, pretty simple. This is another one of those, like I said, traditionally for me, I like quick flies. Um, this is something that you can type a bunch of, uh, have them sitting in the box. It's effective. And uh, something like in this color, I mean, honestly, when I was a kid, this kind of tannish, you know, tannish peaches, peach, um, I threw a lot of Rapalas, you know, F4s, F3s, um, if you know your Rapala numbers in color similar to this that had, you know, the black top with the uh, gold bottom. And I did it really well in smallmouth with it. Well, you know, this isn't much different. And if I really wanted to, and if I had a Sharpie with me, which I don't, I could flip it over because remember it's going to ride hook point up and color the bottom and do that in black. I could, I won't um, just because it's not kind of, you know, I don't typically tie like that. Also, the Estes doesn't take to Sharpie super well. Um, there are materials out there that do. This stuff just really doesn't take super well to Sharpie. Um, but good stuff. This is one of those I've got, usually have a million different colors of it. Um, it's another one of those if I'm in a fly shop and I happen to see a color I don't own. Uh, not uncommon for me to just go, ooh, I need that. Um, so because of the fact that flies like this, crystal buggers, I love throwing crystal buggers. Um, and what is this? This is really a crystal bugger. This is a crystal bugger with dumbbell eyes. Um, you know, I'm sure that Norm would uh, question me on that. That's fine. So, um, all right, guys. Well, I'm going to uh, sit there and say we had fun tonight. Um, I don't know what Brian's planning for next week. Normally I do. Um, but I am not sure what that uh, he's going to do next week. Week after that, we're going to have a special guest. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, going to be out of town. Um, I will probably be on the live stream uh, checking in, but I will not be doing the actual time. We'll have a special guest. We'll get to announce that. And uh, I want to say bye to everybody. Y'all have a, a great evening. Enjoy this. Um, enjoy this weather that we've got coming in. Um, next couple of days are going to be real fun. Um, I don't know about you guys up in Charlottesville, but down here in Richmond, it has been super windy today. So, and uh, y'all have a great evening. Bye.